Welcome, Drew Brees, in New York City. Thank you. And you've been busy while you're here. You're doing a lot of nonprofit stuff, which we're going to talk about. Yeah. But of course, the news of the weekend is going to be the Super Bowl. Are you going to the game? No, I won't be going to the game, but uh, obviously been talking a lot about Why it. Why aren't you, know, you going? Familiar. Uh, don't go to the game unless we're playing in it. <laughs> <laughs> and and had the blessing of being able to do that one time. Hopefully we get that chance again. We had Colin Kaepernick, and he said the same yeah. thing. He's leaving the day of the game. So yeah. you guys really, there's a little bit of tension and still competitiveness even in this week. Huh? Yeah, I mean, it'd be, it'd be hard to sit in person and watch it. I mean, I, I still watch it, but I do that from the comfort of my home or mm -hmm. somewhere else, you know, because you, know, you don't watch it like a normal fan maybe. Um, right. Uh, maybe it's just the insider knowledge of being a player and knowing what it's like to be in that moment. Um, but you, you almost play the game as it's being played. I mean, just in your mind. Yeah. You know, you try to anticipate what's happening. I, I'd say, you know, the familiarity for, for me of, of the Seattle, you know, team and defense, just because we've played them twice in the last, right. you know, two months. Um, you know, you, you, I'm interested to see, kind of watch how Denver tries to attack them. And, um, you know, you, you try to anticipate those things as you're watching. How would you attack Seattle's defense? Well, they're they're tough. <laughs> you yeah. know, there's not there's not a weak link Even in that with, defense. With the man but to man and yeah, you just you know what you try to you try to identify maybe uh, matchups. Um, listen, they've got they've got two great cover corners. I mean, guys that can get up, bump and run. Um, you know, stay with you uh, all over the field. They've got two safeties that um, are as good as any in the game. Right. Earl Thomas in the middle of the field. Cam Chancellor, um, you know, in and around the box, covering tight ends. You know, he's a versatile player. Um, you know the linebacker position is extremely solid. Obviously, they can get pressure on the quarterback. Um, they they have all season long create turnovers and opportunities for their offense. So, um, I think what you got to do is you got to mix it up on them. You've got to try to beat them with tempo. Um, although you know they're a very disciplined defense um, and they play their scheme very well, but just try to find those matchups where you can inside. I mean, listen, Denver's got <laughs> some guys now. Yeah. You know, Demarius Thomas, Eric right. Decker, those guys can make plays. They're big, big physical receivers. Um, of course, Wes Welker, um, you know, in the slot, uh, his ability to, to to get open. He's got a lot of leeway, too. I mean, you can tell that the rapport between him and Peyton Manning is pretty strong. And then Julius Thomas has had an incredible year at the tight end position. So interested to see how they do that and how they're able to run the ball as well because obviously that, that could really mean a lot for their uh, the success of their offense. Where is Denver vulnerable? You know, um, I'm not too familiar with Denver just because, because we right. didn't play them this year. Uh, we played them last year. Right. And, um, they're a team that really seems to have caught fire in all phases um, during, I'd say, these last six to eight weeks. Uh, defensively, they're playing uh, very, very well. Um, they've been really good against the run lately, and they've, they've been able to um, you know, create some turnovers um, and really just holding teams to you know, fewer and fewer points. Um, but uh, they also know what they have on the offensive side of the ball, you know, and uh, obviously those guys can score. So. You know, we'll see. We'll see how it shakes out, but uh, should be a heck of a game. Dare I ask who the winner's going to be? <laughs> I wouldn't bet against either of these guys, to be honest with you. I'm a, I'm a huge Russell Wilson fan. Respect what he's been able to do in his first two years, especially this year, and of course Peyton Manning. So I'm just excited to watch the teams play, but yeah. especially the quarterbacks. And Russell Wilson is a big fan of yours. I had him in here the day before he was drafted. Okay. And he talked all about how he felt like he wasn't too short for the NFL, and he used you. Uh, as an example in the success that you've had. What do you think? Will there, is this era of this stigma against quarterbacks who are under 6'2", is that over? Do you think you and Russell have really helped to change the perception? Um, I mean, maybe. I, I, I think that as I look at this draft that's coming up, um, you know, you've got a guy like Johnny Manziel, you know, who's a six-foot guy. You've got Teddy Bridgewater. He's not, you know, your prototypical, you know, right. size or height guy. Um, and obviously those guys are pretty highly touted and I haven't heard a thing mentioned about their height. You know, all that's been talked about is their playmaking ability and how it would carry over from college to the NFL. So maybe that stigma is kind of disappearing. You know, I think, I think more weight, as it should be, for mm -hmm. the quarterback position be put on probably the intangibles um, and the things like accuracy, leadership ability, um, you know, intelligence, um, you know, Resiliency, resolve, ability to fight through adversity, I mean, all those things that you can see through guys' experiences in college and, and so forth. And, and one final football question, because I want to talk to you about some of your nonprofit stuff and also the endorsement deals mm -hmm. that you have. Um, <clears throat> with being shorter as a quarterback, what is the big deal? Is it that people think that you can't see through the holes or 
or what is it? I think the the the, the obvious and how you do know, you get around the it? obvious assumption would be that um, you know you are you know you're not able to see you're not able to have the vision that a, a taller bigger quarterback would have. Um, Maybe it has something to do with you know your ability to stand confidently in the pocket and deliver the ball you know down the field because typically when a quarterback doesn't have vision he pushes to find lanes you right know, so, so how do you get around in order to do that well you you have trust and confidence and and need to throw with anticipation and need to have great feel you need to have great feel for the game um, I mean <laughs> I'll be the first one to tell you I don't I don't see every throw I don't see wow. the, the place that I throw before I throw it. All the right. time. In fact, probably very few times. Um, I trust that my guy's going to be there. I know the coverage. I know where the de defenders are, and I know that there's not somebody where I'm going to throw this ball. And you just turn it, it loose with trust and anticipation. And is it true that you know where the defenders are going to be even before the snap? Like you can tell where everybody's going to be. Um, in most cases, yes. Um, not all the time. I mean, defenses fool you from time to time, and they do different things from time to time. But um, in most cases, you know you're able to identify what the coverage is pre-snap, and so you can anticipate where defenders, or at least, are supposed to be. They don't always do what they're coached to do, right? You know, and and also too, you know, they they react to things they see. You know, so maybe a defender is supposed to be in a certain zone, and yet he sees something something flashes in front of him that he wants to run and rally to and then all of a sudden that opens up a hole in and behind him so there's times where guys don't always do what they're supposed to but for the most part within a coverage you know where everyone is supposed right. to be and you're speaking like a se the seasoned veteran that you are it's, it's hard to believe but you've been in the league for how many years 13 now? years 13 years uh, and you're doing a lot as a mentor to other players first of all you're on the executive committee of the NFLPA and in that capacity you've kind of been an advocate for, um, well, you have been an advocate for players. What do you think it's going to take to get around some of the high, the high bankruptcy rate in the NFL? Uh, it's preparing for guys, preparing guys for life after football. Um, you know, that's, that's a big adjustment and, and it's, you know, it's no excuse because we need to do, continue to do a better job in educating our men. But uh, in reality, you know, the average NFL career is 3.6 years. Right. We're, we're getting these guys when they're 22 years old. They're still kids. Um, and they're, they're now out of the game at 25, 26, 27. They're still very young men who have not really had an opportunity to, um, you know, understand, uh, I guess, maybe some of the ramifications of uh, and responsibilities of, you know, preparing for life after football and, 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 and taking care of uh, or preparing themselves for when they're not going to be playing the game anymore and they're going to have to go and utilize that college education or whatever it might be. In so many cases, guys get into the NFL, they receive that first paycheck, it's more money than they've ever seen in their entire life, and they think that it's going to last forever. Sure. And unfortunately, as the game shows, it's the average career three and a half years. And so I think the big, the first and foremost, you educate guys that, listen, guys, it doesn't last forever. You live within your means, and you prepare for the future. You prepare for life Is that after what you football. tell the guys? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely. In, in training camp? Uh, yeah, yeah. We have callous programs through the NFLPA, and sure, we continue yeah. to try to better identify programs that, because obviously we, you know, you look at the results, and it's like, hey, we still have a problem here. We, we still need to continue to find ways to improve this. But... Um, the biggest thing is when guys leave the game, we want them to be, you know, secure in their identity. You know, I mean, so many guys, you're, you're identified with as a football player your entire life. I mean, that's what you have done since you were middle school, high school, college, and pros. So that's all you've known. And now all of a sudden you're thrust into the real world. Um, you know, you're behind in regards to, even though you might have that education, you know, that degree from college, you're still behind in regards to the rest of the working world. You know, right. you're, you're getting into the working world in your late 20s where everyone you left college with has now been there for six or seven years. So they're ahead of you. You know, so there's, I think there's an intimidation factor there. I think that there's just a, you know, lack of experience. And so it's just equipping guys with the tools, um, the knowledge to know that they can, they can go out in the real world, they can be successful and um, they've been responsible enough with um, what they've made and, and have everything manage, in yeah. place in order to manage, you know, the rest of their life. What you've made in your peak earning years. Yes. You yeah. can't just wait till the right. post career. I think the biggest thing is just living within your means while you're playing, though. You know, yeah. and understanding that at some point it's going to come to an end and you want to be prepared for that. 
Um, from a nonprofit standpoint, you're in town for the Super, super Service Challenge, yep. uh, which is something you're doing in partnership with Drew, what's it called? The Breeze, Breeze, Dream Dream. Breeze Dream Foundation. So that's yes. your organization. Yeah. Tell me about the Super Yeah, so our organization, the Breeze Dream Foundation, uh, we established that, my wife Brittany and I, 10 years ago, um, back when I played for the San Diego Chargers. Um, and when we got to New Orleans, we really expanded the scope of the foundation from being just about um, helping to care for cancer patients, improve their quality of life, to expanding to the rebuilding efforts in New Orleans. So we were helping to rebuild schools, parks, playgrounds, athletic fields, and fund a lot of children's programs. Um, we've had the great privilege of being able to meet and partner with some great organizations along the way, especially um, the Super Service Challenge. Um, folks, which over the last two years we've been able to contribute two and a half million dollars um, across mm -hmm. the country. Um, specifically, down in New Orleans last year, we were able to infuse a million dollars into that community, 500,000 um, up here in the New York, New Jersey areas for post uh, Sandy recovery. But basically, what the Super Service Challenge is all about is that it challenges companies, organizations, groups to form a team to go out and identify a charity of your choice to serve and to serve that organization. And then within the framework of the challenge, upload the video uh, that, that you've shot, we've encouraged you to shoot, to show exactly what you did, why you did it, and then how they might use funding. Mm -hmm. And then we determine where the funding goes to all these organizations. But every organization receives some form of funding all the way from $2,000 to $25,000. And we've really been able to make a strong impact there and looking really looking forward to the future. It's kind of grown from being a local event to a regional event, national last year, hopefully international next year. And New Orleans, which is the focus of your leadership, has really been strong. Um, and what you're trying to do there is just to get more people involved, right? Because it's the people that are actually going to make the difference in yeah. helping that city come back. We've got, we, we have so many passionate people in New Orleans, um, people that just love the city I and mean, they're deeply ingrained there. They've, family's been there for generations and generations. And so um, we were embraced there in a way back in 2006. I mean, just unbelievably um, uh, with kind of the resurgence of that, you know, the Saints organization in the city. And, and we just felt, we felt a special bond, a, a real calling yeah. to the city of New Orleans. And um, like I said, it's been there? a group effort. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to stay there absolutely. after your career's yeah, over? Yeah, I mean, we love New Orleans. Um, all our children have been born there. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we, we really have a special bond, and there's still a lot of work to be done, but New Orleans is, is truly a land of opportunity. It's, um, you know, rated as uh, one of the best places to go and start a small business. I mean, it is young entrepreneurs are flowing in, you know, by the <laughs> hundreds, you know, uh, all the time. Um, in order to find ways to, you know, help that economy and, and to get involved in the resurgence of the city, and um, you sounding pretty. We're involved good. in some, in some entrepreneurship good, programs Drew. there. Yeah, listen. You sound you sound like you might make a good mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see the city continue oh. to, to grow and and uh, continue to, you know. Uh, make it a place to where, you know, it's not only a good place to visit, you know, for people, uh -huh. but it's a great place for people to raise a family. That's the most important thing. Would you see yourself in public service at some point? Maybe. I mean, I'm not going to close the door on anything. Hopefully okay. I get a chance to play football for, I, mean, I just turned 35, finished my 13th year. I'd love to play till I'm at least 40. Um, we'll see how that goes. Continue to raise kids. <laughs> yeah. And uh, be a great husband are and father. You, and Are you like one of those guys that gets into a oxygenated chamber at the end of every <laughs> game or, or how do you stay conditioned at your age well, put it this way I'm, I'm always open to doing whatever i possibly can to help myself be in the best peak physical condition that i can be um you know obviously within the rules um you know so whatever i can do to kind of beat let's say you know beat the beat yeah. the age age process is the recovery time a lot more for Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, well, and yes, yes, Drew Brees? Yes, that, that's, that's the one thing that you notice. Like, I don't feel like there's anything I can't do now at age 35 that I could do at age 22. Right. The only difference is I wake up the next morning and it hurts a lot more. So, you know, the, 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 the ability to go and just do it again is yeah. what is lacking. So how can, I, how can I beat that process? How can I find that fountain of youth just within my diet, within my sleep habits, within the way that I take care of my body and all mm -hmm. those things? All right. Well, you're doing a good job, man. You Thanks. look young. You feel, feel young. young, right? Feel young, yeah. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you in the Super Bowl next year. I hope so. All right. <laughs> and with Drew Brees, I'm Lee Hawkins. We'll see you next time.